people. I don't know if I'm the most appropriate person, but I'm a person <laughs> here, so I'm going to do my best. But um, we're so excited to have you here. Uh, as you probably know from Wahela Johns is in the U.S. Department of Energy, where she directs the Office of Indian Energy Policy Program. She's responsible for advancing that office's mission to maximize the development and deployment of energy solutions to the benefit of uh, is a member of the Navajo tribe, Arizona. She got involved in energy work through water. Initially, I read one of her interviews, um, and specifically through experiencing coal mining operations that were contaminating her community's groundwater, while little of the energy benefits flowed to the tribe. That experience led her down the path to renewable energy and community organizing. That end, she founded Native Renewables, a nonprofit that builds renewable energy traffic capacity while addressing energy access issues. Her work with the Black Mesa Water Coalition and Navajo Green Economy Coalition has led to groundbreaking legislative victories for groundwater protection, green jobs, and environmental justice. In 2019, she was awarded the Nathan Cummings Foundation Fellowship. Under Wahala's tenure, the Office of Indian Energy budget has tripled from $22 million in 2021 to $75 million. That's including of 30 employees in the office to help implement a lot of these uh, amazing goals and things that are happening at the federal level, which I'm sure we're about to hear all around. I had the pleasure of working with Wahala on a webinar that we uh, sponsored here at Stanford through the Lawyers for a Sustainable Economy Initiative. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar, but it's an initiative that I direct to connect green startups, uh, nonprofits, and tribes with pro bono legal help from major law firms. Really, um, it, it's been a mix of different things, not just on support of renewable energy efforts, but really anything under the sustainability umbrella. Happy to talk more about that with anyone after class or by email if anyone has any questions. Um, but that particular webinar, and it was part of a four part series on the inflation rate. Act and how it is to benefit tribes. That particular webinar was on direct aid for tribes, which is a huge opportunity for tribes to take advantage of cash payments from the federal government um, for qualifying renewable energy projects, even though they're not federal taxpayers. So, um, with that, I will just pass it over to Lanila, if she's the person you are here to hear from. Thank you. Um, so, Yate, do you hear she in the Schlant dog, Ashe Bush's chain, Zitani Dasha Chea do Kiani Dashinelle. Um, say my clans if I have any dinner relatives, any dinner relatives in there. Ooh. All right, so my first clan is Salt, and I'm born for Red Bottom people. Um, and I'm from northeastern Arizona, um, member of the Navajo Nation. Really excited to be here. Um, I think my first presentation here at the campus, um, and just want to say thank you so much, all, um, all the faculty and staff for inviting me to speak. I've um, been based out of D.C. and recently um, moved my family uh, back to the East Bay four weeks ago. Um, I've been a physician for less than four years. Um, and it's been really an amazing journey to um, come from a startup uh, organization company to uh, running one of the most important uh, energy programs in the federal government. Um, I get to work every single day with 570 federally recognized tribes that each have a unique um, agreement with the federal government uh, through treaties, through executive orders. And, you know, I, I was mostly focused in the Southwest because we are addressing a lot of the issues in our communities where um, a lot of families don't have access to electricity. And um, that really sparked my interest in um, this work. And also, like, sort of the history of energy um, equity and energy justice. Uh, because I grew up next to a coal mining industry that uh, provided power for many of the West, uh, for California, Nevada, Arizona, 
Um, and then over the hill from these operations, many of my people uh, today still don't have electricity. 40% uh, of our people still haul water. Um, so very under-resourced these um, of, of you know, what, what I'm talking about. Um, if you don't, aren't from a station or from um, communities that have been struggling um, with heavy energy burden, that's something that you know, I wanted to make sure that I uh, created solutions around addressing some of these um, topics in our community. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and I'm just really, again, honored to be here. I just want to um, also acknowledge uh, the ancestral homelands here, uh, the Ohlone people and all the relatives that I have been able to meet in these many years of being here based in the Bay. Previous to going to D.C., um, I was based in Oakland, California. So, um, And if you don't know the history of this region, I can recommend a lot of good books um, to learn about the history of this region. And um, yeah, so I would, I would want to encourage you all um, as our future and our young leaders here in this room is that many times... Uh, when we talk about the federal government and what I'm presenting and how we got here, um, we have to go back to the treaties. We have to go back to the agreements that were made between tribes and the federal government and understand what our commitment was as the federal government and what our responsibilities are. Um, same with the state, same with the state of California. You know, there's a huge history here and why um, certain landmarks are called a certain name, uh, but also. Um, there are still a lot of uh, amazing, beautiful um, indigenous relatives, Ohlone relatives that live here that we can also learn from. So um, that's something I just want to offer you all since you are going to school here. And I really think the Bay Area is a unique place to be. All right. My team designed this beautiful PowerPoint presentation. So I'm going to run through it really quick. <laughs> um, this is uh, my uh, deputy director, David Conrad. He is of the Osage, um, he's Osage citizen. And um, he and I both have been, um, yeah, sort of leading this organization. Here's our team. We are based in uh, DC. Um, a lot of our positions that we have out now um, that we're trying to fill are um, also, uh, folks can work from home, uh, remote locations and, Many folks are located in Alaska, in Denver. Um, so going straight into our uh, budget and Holmes actually knows, you all have questions about our office. Holmes knows a lot about our office, um, the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, we were stood up in 2005 from the Energy Policy Act. And um, our mission is really to focus on helping to, uh, helping tribes to, you know, achieve their energy vision. Um, since 2010 and 2024, we've invested more than 100 million into 240 tribal energy projects, and it's pretty significant um, the amount of work that tribes are putting in to uh, build and design these beautiful projects in their communities and, um, yeah, sustaining their uh, their communities. Um, this is a chart that just shows uh, when I came into this role, um, it was heavily un uninvested. I mean, there was, I think our, in 2020, um, our budget was uh, close to 7 million. And um, part of my uh, interest in joining the team was to want to increase the investment for our office because I know that 22 million isn't enough for 574 fairly recognized tribes. And so that's been something that we were working really hard on, increase the investment in the Office of Indian Energy. And um, just last year, we were able to get 65 million, close to 65 million out the door. Um, and it's exciting. It's exciting when you are able to have um, funding to provide to tribal projects um across the country and the need is there um, there's huge gaps in um uh, that tribes have in like capacity 
Um, they need people. They need expertise um, to be able to design these really complicated energy systems for their geographic region. Many um, of our investments go to Alaska, where um, tries to learn, um, uh, Native communities are, you know, pay close to a dollar per kilowatt. And so um, high energy burden in Indian country. Um, so this is total of how we how much we've been generating 63 million watts generation from 2010 and 2024, um, which is pretty significant. And we've been seeing a huge trend in the country, which is I always say tribes are leading the way in clean energy. Um, Prior to the IRA, prior to um, the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, which is the biggest clean energy investment in this country, it's amazing. It's gonna, uh, it's, it's doing so much. I'm so pumped up about it and all the benefits. And um, but prior to that, uh, our small investment has been um, going towards mostly clean energy projects, renewable energy projects um, for rural remote communities and. Um, a combination of wind, battery storage, and uh, you know, tribes are being really creative in the way that they design the systems. You see a diversity of technology that's um, they're applying in their communities, and it's really to sustain their communities in case of um, yeah wildfires, in case of flooding, um, more of preparing themselves to. Uh, weather the impacts of climate change. So um, really, really cool projects that I've been able to witness in these last four years. Um, and then also just the capacity that it's building. So many benefits. Um, so we um, came out with a report. Do you all want to look at this report? We just came out with it last year. Um, they, Congress wanted us to look at energy access and power reliability in Indian country. And um, what we found is that about, there are about 17,000 tribal homes, Native American homes that don't have access to electricity. Um, and then also just the heavy energy burden um, that tribes face day to day. And um, yeah, it's 28, much higher than the average American. Power outages are experienced 6.5. Um, more times than an average American. And um, so when you look at Indian country and um, the reality, when you visit communities and nations, um, you know, you, you have to think about this, again, this history and the pattern of energy uh, development in this country and who's benefiting and who's not. And so part of this administration's commitment is to um, make sure we elevate the communities that have been left behind, the communities that um, disadvantaged communities, under-resourced communities, to prioritize them in making sure we are um, achieving um, success and that they are able to sustain, have good, sustainable power. Um, I don't know if this will work or if we have a speaker, but my team put videos in here. Um, and if this is not going to, then we, maybe we can send it around to you. Not going to play. <laughs> I don't think. Yeah. Come back to that. But that video was about tribes talking to how um, they view tribal energy sovereignty, what it means to them. And these are um, tribes that have been deploying clean energy in their communities. Um, a little bit of background for our office um, <coughs> we provide financial assistance, um, so grants, federal grants. And we provide technical assistance at no cost. Um, and then we do a lot of education and capacity building. So that's sort of the three pillars for our office. Um, we're excited uh, as we are getting more investment uh, to announce this uh, prize. Um, tribal college universities. If you don't know, in this country, um, that are mostly in rural remote areas. And interesting is that um, language revitalization, uh, they're focused on food sovereignty and uh, clean energy. 
Um, and so we came out with a prize recently. Um, the nexus of energy and food sovereignty. Exciting. Um, we have a $30 million uh, funding opportunity that's going to be coming out to support um, sort of pre-development work. Uh, most of our grants in these last 10 years have focused on deployment technology. Um, and we, in these last four years, just hearing from tribes is that they need funding for feasibility studies, funding for planned, like planning grants, just to start um, to think through, you know, the long-term strategy and generating power for themselves. And then also um, the ideas of generating for outside their, uh, for the nation and outside their reservations. Um, <clears throat> so this is available. It's really exciting. Uh, we have a funding opportunity. I'm, I'm excited about these ones because this is a 3.6 million for nonprofit um, regional intertribal orgs. Um, there are over 30 intertribal organizations throughout the uh, country that are um, made up most of the, the unique uh, role they play is that most of these intertribal organizations are made up of tribal leaders. So they represent um, in different regions. So we have, I'm not sure which one is here in California. There's several here in California. Arizona, New Mexico, I mean, they're all located all over, but um, this is a funding opportunity to help us so at, at that level. And so this is um, really exciting. We also have a new fellowship program that we have been, um, and these are all new initiatives uh, that we've been you know, sparking within our uh, organization to one, build capacity, but also um, uh, to engage more of um, young people and people who are um, learning about energy or have an interest in energy. Um, we're excited about this fellowship. They are going to be hosts with tribes. Um, I think, I can't remember how much, how many we, I think we selected 11 um, currently. And so we're trying to expand that into next year. Um, so this is a really amazing video that we just came out with yesterday and it's not going to work, but I will make sure to get it to you. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is a, a one example of a story or um, the tribe telling their story uh, in Hickory's Pueblo um, in northern New Mexico. And they did a one megawatt solar with battery storage. And then they're doing the phase two right now, an additional uh, megawatt of solar. And the reason why Hickory's Pueblo did this these projects is because they had a, you know, yeah, they were being, uh, I think it was like four or five years ago, there was a huge wildfire that came near their communities and um, power outages went, you know, uh, affected their um, health facility, their community. And so, um, yeah, this is them trying to make sure that they have backup power for their people, but also they um, are lowering the cost of um, power. So if you aren't aware, this is our annual program review that we host um, every year. And if you want to learn more about all of the projects we've supported in the um, past 10 years, many people come and talk about their projects from Alaska, um, all over the country. And it's a week long, uh, November 18th to the 22nd. We're on social media, you can follow us. We have an amazing newsletter with all the funding opportunities. Um, all of our information. I think that's the end of this presentation for my team. Around um, but I, I mean, I think the big piece is that um, I am really excited about is um, the energy justice aspect of um, how DOE is, you know, weaving that into the values of how we go about making sure that we are um, doing well for tribes, uh, doing better in our engagement, doing better in consultation practice. Um, when energy projects are you know, being proposed or there are funding opportunities that might have impact on tribal lands. Um, 
So we've been pushing for many things to in building our internal capacity um, of knowing, but also the expertise that is um, important in the way that we engage in the tribes. Um, huge opportunity in, in, in the U.S. in partnerships. That's something that we've been really pushing. Um, industry is a, with all these tax uh, credits and um, there's a lot of benefits if there's partnerships. And um, yeah, it just everything as far as like making sure that, um, you know, as projects continue to move along, that we're doing it in a way that is um, giving back and that tribes have real equity ownership. Um, yeah, I mean, these are all like the values that we, um, from this administration, have been pushing. I don't know if any of you have heard Justice 40, but that's a big one that um, DOE has embraced. We require um, all applications to fill out um, part of the application is um, from whoever the applicant is, is that we require 20% of the scoring of the application they, they uh, goes to community benefits. So demonstrating that how they are going to give back to the community that they're going to be doing the project in. Um, yeah, so when it comes to job creation, revenue generation, um, co-ownership, I mean, these are just examples. Um, so that's been an area, I think, more DOE-wide. Uh, the pieces that our office have been taking on is also around um, making sure that federal government are prioritizing the procurement of uh, clean electricity from tribes and and products, clean energy products. So we call that the Indian Energy Purchase Preference. Um, and that's been a huge uh, milestone. We just, um, it went dormant, I think. It started in 2000. Five, I think it was like 20 years. It just hasn't been used, this preference. And um, for the first time this year, uh, there was a, a GSA was able to utilize the purchase preference because of the amazing team that we're building within Office of Energy. And, um, but also other offices that, you know, love to tackle big, you know, complicated uh, policy and actually try to get it um, implemented. And I think that this is something that is um, significant for our office. The other one is that we were able to, um, the loan program office has a tribal energy financing program. They have up to 20 billion of loan authority um, for clean energy projects or, um, and they just, I think, would say two weeks ago announced their first um, deal. That they got out the door with um, one of the tribes here in California, um, and it's the Viejas tribe, and and this is a beautiful partnership where you're seeing tribes supporting tribes, the tribe, uh, uh, the band of uh, I think like uh, Chippewa, um, partnered, or they have an LLC that partnered with um, tribe here in Southern California to do um, solar and battery storage. So it's it's really amazing um, when you see a federal government and Congress uh, create language uh, that and provisions that help um, lessen the burden and create more accessibility uh, for tribes and disadvantaged communities. So many things can happen, um, and and that's what I'm witnessing in this role. That's what I'm witnessing. Um, it's becoming more trendy and it's become it's building i think uh, a different way of doing energy deployment um and that's exactly what i um have always wanted uh i had you know we have a company that uh, was over the hill from us mm -hmm. just you know exporting power um coal and water and no benefits in the community um, and so we want to flip that, right? And we want to make sure that as we are thinking about building our energy systems, that is done in a way that is um, equitable to everybody. But I think the other thing is that um, there's a good history here that isn't pretty, but it's important for us to understand, um, you know, the why do we have 20,000 homes that don't have electricity 
is because tribes were intentionally left out in the 1923 um, Electrification Act. They weren't considered um, in the way that the design of transmission build out in the West. So, and right now we're still trying to figure out, like, how do we get power to the people? Um, and I would say in this last six months, there's been a significant amount of money going to tribal nations um, to address energy access, to address um, the you know heavy energy burden that tribes face. We have a huge um, home rebates program where I think it's 225 million for tribes um, set aside um, so that they can be able to well, one lower costs of um, their bills every month and incorporate, you know, electrification, like heat pumps, um, being able to have electric stove. Um, so, you know, f- homes that don't have wiring, uh, this funding can support that. So I'm really excited about, uh, one, just the commitment that this administration has had on uh, sort of environmental justice communities, tribes, um, and, you know, tasking us to really figure out how to come up with solutions. And, um, yeah, it's been really a beautiful experience. And I, I think um, I'm getting close to the end of my tenure here. And um, really, I think that I would love to see um, so much grow and, and whatever happens, you know, in these next few weeks. But um, we are on to something. And when Indian country wins, everybody else wins. And that's been something I see over and over. Um, so, and for you all, I think um, my uh, request is that, um, you know, there's a lot of students here that are studying energy and um, the field is just becoming more, I mean, I think what we're seeing as practitioners is um, making sure that it's um, equitable making sure that um, you know any policy that is inclusive and accessible and you know breaking down the barriers that um, maybe uh, you might not know about but I definitely learned when I went to Alaska that um, I went to go visit a small village and uh, they pay close to a dollar per kilowatt um, and I think uh, sitting down with some of the tribal administrators who wear five hats and have very little connectivity coming into their tribal office, and it's a small room, really. And, um, you know, how it looks like behind their desk, right behind their desktop or their computer that they're sitting at, totally different than in D.C. And I think those are the things that, you know, we have to really um, understand is, like, we got to go to these communities got to learn and understand, you know, why is it these applications challenging for tribes or disadvantaged communities? Um, yeah, what are the, what is the communication gap? And all of this is around, like, the policy piece, too, that could be designed in a way that really benefits um, the people. So I think I'm close to being done now, but that's what I want to offer to you all. Um, I appreciate uh, time that you've given us, so thank you so much. Thank you, John, for sharing your uh, insights from your amazing journey this last year. We really appreciate what you've done and the fact that you're here sharing this uh, with all of us. Now it's time for audience open audience questions. This is prior to the we have a pretty good group signed up for the after seminar thing, but now we, we have uh, open audience questions. We usually start these with student questions by preference, since this is, uh, we have about 100 registered students, which is somewhat of a record, I think, which is great. Good to see great speakers do that kind of thing. So let's go in the back middle there. <laughs> Hi. Well, thank you so much for the really informational presentation. Um, something I'm really curious about is like 
how you as a director are thinking about, especially as your tenure comes to an end, what the follow through of your investments and of your programs will look like if there is a potential regime shift within the country. Um, specifically, like there has been like certain candidates have been pretty vocal about like cutting certain funding and um, like expanding the expand constricting the expansion of certain like energy programs and stuff like that. So I'm really curious, like how are you thinking like long beyond yourself? Like how do you actually follow through with those investments and get to the outcomes that you're um, hoping for? Yeah. Um, so great question. The uh, most of uh, you know the uh, I would say in yeah. So <laughs> be careful what I say. Um, I think it's a part of building the culture of our the teams, um, and that's been something that I uh, really care about is team culture. And making sure that, I mean, I'm the only political appointee and the rest of my whole team are career, um, federal, um, yeah, federal staff. And um, what I say is that we as a team have to, our pillars are kind of North Star, the tribes and their value system, and that we have to reflect that. Um, and it doesn't matter which administ whatever you know if the change if the changing happens um, of administrations that um, my perspective is be um, yeah it's pretty durable our office for just for our office and that we are able to um, continue to move forward and I think most of Indian country are in um, areas or states that um, pretty. Uh, they have good relationships with like the, a lot of the states that are, um, you know, um, that could be looked at as difficult. Um, and I believe that tribes have a um, so much of a history that uh, and, and relationship with states and congressional leaders that um, they're really are outspoken about their needs and and that's helpful, you know, and um, they're really active. So I think that. Uh, for tribes, I'm not as worried. I'm just, I think that this growth in these last three years to go from 7 million to 75 and hopefully more um, is something that is um, going to continue no matter what administration comes in. So, I mean, it would be weird if they cut the budget back down to 7 million or something. You know, I just, it's hard for me to see that happening, but yeah. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for the insightful presentation. So one of the slide points out that the tribes they have they face an excess burden of around twenty eight percent as compared to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering what's the meaning of that burden? What does it constitute? And second is, uh, you mentioned that investment also flowed to many grids. So if uh, tribal regions are excluded from the transmission network, so what's the role of the many grids? Are they successful? Are they working? Yeah, when you face energy burden, I mean, or there's energy poverty, which is not having access to electricity. It means um, not having refrigeration, not having... Um, connectivity um so uh not having yeah it, and it adds up you know if you don't have a refrigerator in the summer you go and use ice chests and you buy more ice right and depending on your the temperature of your community um, it adds up like I, I just i see this and then also the reliance on diesel or um gasoline generators um kerosene is a big user for people who don't have electricity um, and those costs are a lot you know many of these families live in rural remote places so you go and drive and you know several hours to the store to get the fuel to bring it back to their home it, it just all adds up so um, it's also a health impact and um, when you burn you know fuels you know generators night and day um, 
So, and these are folks that already have limited income. And, and I think that's the part that I, I feel like, you know, even with a, seeing a battery storage and um, solar, the offset is just like significant when it comes to um, the pollution that is being generated by a gasoline generator or like, um, yeah, the uh, cost is a big one. Um, I think that, you know, uh, for now, our office is um, going to go deeper in doing, we're doing in the process of doing a study or collecting data on where specifically are these homes and what nations um, in the country that are facing these issues. And um, I think there's over 10 tribes that have heavy um, energy poverty in their communities. And um, yeah, and the isolating regions, um, I think, bear the brunt of um, the high costs and also the dependence on diesel fuel. Um, so these rural remote areas, I love that um, inflation, as a bipartisan infrastructure law, they had 10 billion set aside for uh, rural remote communities. And this year, I can't remember what the number is, but it's probably well over 300 million that have gone to um, native communities, tribes in supporting um, or helping to alleviate um, you know, this energy burden and with, and they're all proposing these amazing projects, all clean energy projects in, from Alaska to here in the lower 48. Yeah. Lots of success. And that, so it's ERA. ERA is, it's like, I call it rural remote, but I, I forgot the acronym. It's under the office of clean energy demonstrations. Hello, thanks for the thoughtful answer to that last question. I was also wondering about the energy burden. My question pertains to education and reinvestment. There's a Stanford adjunct professor who runs a business focused on energy efficiency of minority owned commercial buildings, and he employs minority workers when possible. So my question is, of the $65 million of projects last year, what proportion were done by Indian or minority owned contractors? Um, so I think that, I mean, I, I don't know the percentage. Um, I can get back to you all on that. Um, the beautiful thing is that majority of these projects are um, designed by like that video as by, by Pickery's Pueblo. They built their internal capacity. Um, when you watch, when you listen to them more, they they talk about um, employing their own people and building um, the expertise so that they can um, do operations and maintenance. Um, that's one story of many that we see when we go to visit, um, because they know that they can't depend on somebody from the outside. Uh, majority of these tribes are in rural, remote places, um, but it also just like adds so much value to and knowledge and growth when you invest in your own um, community or nation. So um, this goes directly to the tribe. This is a unique thing about our office is we give directly to tribes, um, which sort of are considered disadvantaged communities or uh, now justice warning communities. And um, I think that's unique that uh, we are able, and it takes longer, our money gets up, it takes a while. We, we go through like maybe maybe a year from when we select a project to when we like obligate or give the money to the, the tribe. And in that time period, um, we learn a lot about their own internal capacity. Um, we learn a lot about um, how the market changes and price changes and we negotiate if that goes up or down. Um, and also about like their long-term vision of uh, their energy vision. Many times this is a stepping stone to something more. And so the trend we've been seeing is that we'll do provide free technical assistance for a very long time, or they'll come to our program review and just like listen and learn. Um, and then maybe we'll see an application a year or so later from that tribe. Um, and then when they, get maybe selected um it just 
you know, their capacity grows and they're able to build a bigger workforce and knowledge and submit for another application. So that's a trend we've been seeing. And so a lot of these tribes are building off, you know, the previous um, projects that they designed and deployed to move into certain areas like Picaris. This is their phase two. Mm -hmm. Yo, My name is Antonio Vega. I'm from the Pascuayaki tribe. Oh, okay. Just to preface, like, you were like, your work is super amazing and also inspiring for like Native youth like me. But the main question that I want to like ask you is, what are your thoughts about the Inflation Reduction Act, and mm. how does it relate to Native youth or Native communities in the mm. U.S.? Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, actually, I'm really proud. Um, our office uh, did a when, when we came in. Um, or when I came in, <laughs> um, I really advocated for people who don't have electricity. Um, so I'm like, Department of Energy, this is our this, this is our jam. We should be doing this, like providing power to the people. And um, did lots of presentations to Congress around um, trying to raise two billion dollars to solve energy access. Um, and you know that went through a series of bills. Um, it was, uh, I think I can't remember the bill back better bill was like, I think it was, the marking was at 500 million, which was like pretty awesome. Um, I thought it was awesome. And, um, and then it got lowered to 300 million to another bill. <laughs> and then, uh, when the inflation reduction act, as I don't know if y'all remember, but it was sort of like, it just happened like within a week or something. It just like, was just a surprise bill. Um, and so when it was. Uh, ready for viewing, we went through it and just like looked up all tribal, you know, allocations. And the last page, seriously, the last page of the Inflation Reduction Act was 150 million, 55 million for um, unelectrified homes or um, uh, energy access. And that's something that we pushed early on. Like when we, when I first came in, it's not, you know, one billion or two billion, but at least, you know. Pushing for these things are really important, and I think for you um, and your people, it's um, important to use your voice and um, also your knowledge to be able to um, advocate for um, your communities because you bring a perspective that is unique that folks that are on the other side or that are writing a lot of the um, the language in the bills that. You know, you have to paint that picture of what is it like for a family that gets electricity for the first time and the benefits, right? And, um, but also that I think for me, growing up in an environmental justice community is just tell the story of, um, you know, how important it is to have um, the benefits, you know, community benefits to, to have um, uh, that empowerment aspect of projects that are being proposed in our communities that it really is like um yeah good communication that's the thing that i really um think is important but um there is a lot of education that i have to do at different levels and i think you'll learn that um whatever uh, area you go into that you know bringing your perspective of your home and your people is um going to be really valuable for um, in the long term, I guess, for, for um, the benefit of, of the people. So um, the Inflation Reduction Act also has, um, for the first time, has allowed tribes to take advantage of the tax credits. And I think this is pretty significant to, and to nonprofits and um, to some state governments, right? I think, and, but the tribal governments was one that I think was really hard for tribes to be uh, to participate in the um, clean energy deployment in this country, um, so that's a huge um, win for Indian country. The other win is that um, this is two hundred twenty-five million home rebates electrification program, and um, the other one is the 
loan program office, a uh, tribal finance program went from 2 billion to 20 billion. And, and for the loan program office to do direct, um, direct loans. So lots of good things there. We still are working on to make sure that, um, tribes are fully engaged, that they have all the tools necessary to take advantage of all of these incentives in the inflation reduction act. Um, but again, it goes back to like who's writing, right? Who's creating that language and how we um, uh, make sure that the, the language is in line with the things that will benefit um, tribes. Questions have been really, really good. Let's take one more before we think of our final thanks maybe up here. Is it okay? Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and for all the work that you do. Uh, my name is Brian Kendall. I'm a first year master's student in the atmosphere and energy program. Um, energy justice informs rem remedying past harms done by legacy energy technology. Um, Director Shalanda Baker agrees that restorative justice is integral to a just energy transition. Um, so I have a question uh, for you. That is, are you able to fund projects to facilitate the remediation of abandoned uranium mines on indigenous lands, of which there are hundreds? Um, and then second, what are your thoughts on the contemporary uranium mining happening on indigenous lands um, that are largely being spurred by the uh, DOE and its efforts for nuclear energy? Thank you. Cool. Um... Uh, yeah, this one's a, uh, I'm from Navajo. We have, I think, over 500, um, uranium mines that still need cleanup. Um, so this topic is, uh, really, uh, yeah, it's a sensitive topic for me, um, and have many relatives that have, um, are still dealing with, um, health impacts. Um, thousands, thousands of our people have been dealing with health impacts due to the uranium mining. Um, and we are a part of this amazing organization that, you know, um, a lot of investment in Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law to build out um, the supply chain for um, uh, uranium and, uh, you know, uh, everything that uh, that can support on clean energy when it comes to nuclear energy. Um, so I think for me as a tribal member, um, it's important that I help inform um, this, this agency of the sensitivities that tribes face um, around uranium mining, the history. Um, but I also think it's important that um, we do our homework um, that it's not just me educating, that it's the agency um, overall is educating themselves about the um, the history of uranium mining, the impacts, and then the need for cleaning up, the need for remediation, the need for um, helping to sustain a fund that will give back to families that have been affected by radiation exposure. Right now, I think yesterday they had a hearing, or was it today? at the Senate uh, 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 Senate Committee on Indian Affairs on um, RICA. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with RICA, um, so that we can um, continue to support the families affected by uranium contamination. Um, yeah, I think that there are, um, again, back to my role, uh, strategy to make sure that we are equipping tribes with um, the tools, but also the capacity um, and all of the information needed to participate in understanding where they're at in, um, when it comes to these emerging technologies and they're a lot more new, like the um, advanced nuclear reactors, um, small modular reactors, and um, yeah, these are things that I think we'll continue to uh, look at and um, 
hopefully um, do better in our tribal engagement and tribal consultation practice. So that's my, that's been, that's goes through for critical minerals. That goes through for so many other technology that coincidentally, um, they're all near on, on tribal lands. So we don't want an EJ 2.0 <laughs> happening in um, from this big investment in clean energy. We, as I agree with Shalanda Baker is that um, many of the bipartisan infrastructure law, Inflation Reduction Act are targeting existing facilities where there's oil, coal, gas, you know, um, to invest in those areas. Um, so Shalanda is an amazing leader and um, it's good to stand alongside with her in, in the Department of Energy um, because we, I've learned a lot from the Gulf of Mexico and that region and the build out that's happening there and making sure that uh, we center community, we center um, capacity building and resources to um, the communities that bear the brunt of pollution. So yeah, good question. <laughs>